Nigel joins me now. Uh, welcome to GB News and um, congratulations on the book. How do you make a moral reckoning of the British Empire? It, it, it's difficult because um, in the 300 years of British Empire, you've got a list of bad things that happened, a list of good things that happened. What you can't do is say that one outweighed the other. So what I do is to say, was there something really evil at the heart of the empire? Was it essentially racist? Was it essentially oppressive? And I say, no, it wasn't. There was nothing um, uh, uh, like the Nazi regime in the British Empire. And then I add to that the fact that there were consistent humanitarian liberal streams, like the one you mentioned, the 150-year effort to suppress slavery all over the world. Yeah, tell me something about your academic discipline. You approach this as a what? Uh, I'm, a, I'm an ethicist. Uh, my first degree was in history, but I, I'm a pro professional ethicist. Uh, so, um, unlike any historians I know, I, I do have ethical qualifications to try and assess complex phenomena. Uh, but I'm not a professional historian, and I, in my book I depend on what I've read, uh, written by other professional historians. Um, uh, but I've covered a lot of territory, and, and no doubt I've made some mistakes. But in t I'm, I'm most interested in, in trying to reach a kind of moral assessment. OK, I've already said in the introduction that the slave trade was abolished by the British in 1807 and slavery in the British Empire by Act of Parliament in 1833. But there were centuries before that in which there was slavery and millions of Africans were transported across the Atlantic uh, by European nations, including the British, to colonies in what is now the United States and the Caribbean. No defence of that? No, no defence of it. I, I mean, slavery uh, I regard as, as, uh, as abhorrent. But we do need to put it in context. Uh, we need to recognise that slavery was um, an accepted institution from the ancient period to um, up until the modern, and it was practised from, from uh, the Muslim world to, to the Comanche in uh, what's now the southwest of the US in the 1700s. Uh, and we, we need to understand how, how common it was so that, that even escaped slaves, slaves who, who escaped from plantations in, the, in Jamaica and went into the forested mountainous area in the centre, the Maroons, they kept slaves of their own. And I was in, I was in um, Raleigh, North Carolina in, in January, went to the Museum of the History of North Carolina, and, and even there I discovered uh, on the eve of the American Civil War there were 30,000 freed slaves, some of whom kept slaves of their own, so common was the practice. So no defence of it, but we do need to put this in context. Yes. Uh, let's talk about racism in a different context. You, you, a moment ago, absolved the British Empire of racism. But, for example, in a place like India, it would not have been possible for an Indian to achieve the very highest rank in the British Empire. It depended upon Indian administrators, but they were always considered as people who would not be given the very top jobs. Is that not correct? Uh, that, that, that is correct, uh, and that was one failing of, of the empire, and I, I make that clear in the book. So I, I don't entirely... I, I, it would be impossible entirely to absolve the British Empire of, of racism. It contained uh, uh, racism of various kinds, and, and I regard racism as, as, uh, as abhorrent. Uh, my point is simply it, it was a mixture. On the one hand, you, you do have uh, racial prejudice, let's say, in southern Africa. Uh, you do have the exclusion of, of Indians from the upper echelons of government in India. But you also have this 150-year this, um, uh, uh, policy of abolishing slavery all over the world on the basis of the fundamental equality of all, all human beings under God. Um, and you also have, uh, even in India, you have the development of, of liberal institutions and the gradual democratisation of India in the 1920s and 30s. So the, the British Empire did, did learn lessons as it went along. One, one point I wasn't quite sure you did make in the book was that um, r racism went along with other things. For, for instance, it was considered that women were inferior. They weren't allowed the vote, for example. It was considered that the working classes were inferior. They weren't allowed the vote. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't just brown people and black people that the British establishment had prejudice about. No, we need to remember uh, um, men and women together did not get the vote until as late as 1928 <clears throat> in Britain. Um, uh, and if we, if we complain about, let's say, in, in Cape Colony in southern Africa... Uh, Africans were granted the vote in the same terms as whites as, as early as 1853, but there weren't many Africans who, who qualified. But the truth is, in England at that time, most uh, English people, most British people were excluded from the vote too. Uh, so we need to remember that democracy, mass democracy was developing, but didn't really um, come to, to uh, it, its, its fruition until the 19, late 1920s.
Um, you've brought us to South Africa. Let's have a word about Cecil Rhodes. How, how do you assess him? Now, here is a fellow whose statue has been... Well, I, I don't think it was toppled. No, either, no, it hasn't been toppled. There, there, but there, there have been calls for it to be toppled. Yes. Uh, uh, how is the moral reckoning of Cecil Rhodes? Yeah, so uh, I ended up defending uh, Rhodes against him being toppled in, in Oxford as early as 2015-16. And the reason was that, that uh, it seemed to me that uh, 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 no one really cared about the details of Rhodes. It, it was that Rhodes symbolised colonialism which equalled racism and therefore deserved to be toppled. And uh, as my book tries to, to explain, the, the, the moral record of, of British colonial endeavour was, was really mixed. It wasn't simply racism. It wasn't simply oppression. And so uh, I wanted Rhodes to stand because I, I didn't want... Uh, the, the distorted reading of history put on to him to, to triumph. But, but as for Rhodes, uh, as a person, I mean, if, if I wanted to, to put up a poster boy to Empire, it wouldn't be Rhodes. I mean, he was a really mixed character, buccaneering, uh, um, pr pretty ruthless. Um, he was an entrepreneur. All, all entrepreneurs hate being constrained. Um, nevertheless, he was not South Africa's Hitler, as, as some people say, um, um, he indulged in sort of low-grade uh, racist uh, prejudice against Africans, but he was not a biological racist. I mean, he did say, he did believe that Africans could uh, could learn and be educated and be civilised. And as late as the late 1980, uh, 1890s, a few years before he died, he was defending the, the right of Africans to vote in Cape Colony. I hope, I hope many viewers may think that you've taken rather a balanced view of things here, but do you want to say something about how you have suffered for your views? <laughs> well, I'm of a generation, Michael, I don't want to dwell on my own victimhood, but since you ask, um, certainly uh, um, in 2017, when I published an article in, in the London Times uh, uh, making what I thought was the entirely anodyne point that um, uh, we British can find cause for shame and pride in our imperial past, um, that provoked uh, an attempt by a Cambridge academic to, to shut uh, down a project I'd launched on Ethics and Empire a few months before. Uh, there were three online p petitions uh, in the space of a week. Uh, the last one addressed to Oxford University, uh, pressing them to pull the plug on my project. Um, my name was in the press uh, for three weeks. In, in the end, the, the result was good because I, I got a contract to write a book for Bloomsbury. Uh, but then uh, I produced the manuscript for Bloomsbury at the end of 2020. My uh, commissioning editor said he was delighted with it, predicted sales of up to 20,000 copies, said it was uh, an important book. Um, uh, but then three uh, months later in March 21, the top of Bloomsbury sent me an email saying, we're postponing publication indefinitely because, they said, public feeling is unfavourable. And I, I, I pressed them on, <laughs> there's lots of public feeling, uh, uh, public, the public doesn't feel one thing. I said, which, which public feeling do you care about? <coughs> they wouldn't answer me and they returned the contract. How are your sales doing? Uh, it's been in the Sunday Times bestseller list for uh, two weeks. It's, it's doing great. <laughs> well, uh, I, I will say that it's an excellent read. I, en I enjoyed you. reading it. I think people should read this book. Uh, many thanks to... Uh, my